I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles. Let's go over to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. I, I've been meditating on this a lot this past week. And um, there's a story I heard this week that I thought you'd appreciate. Uh, it was about a really lonely, lonely frog. It was a lonely frog. And uh, he was really lonely. And so he had, he was so lonely, in fact. You're supposed to say, how lonely was he? But we'll, we'll skip that. He was so lonely, in fact, that he called the, the psychic hotline to see if there was any, any hope for him. And so the, the person on the end of the line said, well, what I, what I perceive is you're going, to, you're going to meet a very lovely young human girl. And he says, well, he perked up. He's like, well, that's, that sounds good. Am I going to meet her at a party or what? He said, no, in a biology class. <laughs> and she, <laughs> so, you know, she's going to be very interested in everything about you. She's going to, you know, so I thought that was pretty good. Do you know when it comes right down to it, we all go through this life alone. Even when we're married, we're all standing in our own shoes. When we depart, we're going out alone unless it's some kind of an accident or something that's tragic like that. And for you and me, it's important for us to get this thing right. And the Bible is replete with directives about how to make sure, you know, we're on the right path. And uh, so the title of the message today is The Way of Righteousness. The Way of Righteousness. And when you look at Psalm one, you basically have what we might call here an introduction to the entire book of Psalms. Because you're going to see, if you were to read from beginning to end all 150 chapters, uh, all 150 Psalms, you would find that, in fact, they deal with people who are on one road or on the other. You know, there are only two roads. There's the right road and the wrong road. And I know the world doesn't like the whole idea of right and wrong, but we know that they exist. Uh, we know that if we break laws in the, in the human law books, that they, they have absolute consequences that pretty much are mandated. If you take care of your body poorly, you might have a consequence because there's a laws about how they govern our, our, our ability to function. If you don't eat, you're going to get hungry and you're going to de deteriorate. Uh, if you stay out in, in too long, don't get enough sleep, those things. These are like laws, principles. These are uh, things that we have to live by because we know they're there even if we want to deny them. And with this particular chapter, it's a short chapter, but it is so profound. Because what we have set before us is the way of righteousness. Now, I say that, but truly, uh, to be more clear about it, there's actually two ways set forth here. But God doesn't tell us the way of, uh, of, of unrighteousness so that we'll take it. He's telling us, here's the right one just now. And then he contrasts it with the other. So really, it's about the way of righteousness. And I trust that each one of us has come to terms with who God is, but sadly what we're going to see is that sometimes people, uh, maybe even uh, sincere people, are on the wrong path or on the wrong way and don't even know it. Uh, and what, with that said, I, I want to just say to you as we break this particular chapter down or psalm down, that in it is set before us that there is a journey that there is a journey, and you know that. You've been on one. Somebody said marriage is just a long walk together, you know, and that's true. Everywhere you go, you know, you get up in the morning, you go out to the store, you go to the, you know, go to the restaurant. You're always a long walk together, and sometimes you take the deliberate walks. Linda and I take walks sometimes. Our neighbors said, oh, they're going out for their love walk. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's cute. That's the way she processed it in her mind. It was very sweet of her to say. <clears throat> but here's the thing. There are, uh, this is a journey, but there's also a judgment, and that's kind of what the, the governor is on the whole thing. We need to recognize there's a journey, and that's something we need to focus on for ourselves as, as people who live, and, you know, many of us have kids and grandkids possibly, and we want to tell them, you know, yeah, you're on a journey. And sometimes people will be easily approached if you ask them if you are trying to strike up a conversation, like I was on a plane or something, you say, hey, well, how, where are you in your spiritual journey? Uh, and that's a little softer way of sometimes of breaching the subject. Because we all know we are. We're on a journey. And we're running around. Sometimes you feel like you're in a fishbowl fish because you're always running in the, wrong, in the same circles. But there's a journey and there's a judgment. And those two things, not, the knowledge of those two things will help us uh, get ourselves ready for the way in which we 
uh, must go, and we must choose to go. And the Bible says in Psalm 1, in verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, when you see the word blessed, many times things come to mind that are uh, very familiar to us. We remember the Beatitudes. Those of us who love the book of Revelation, we understand it is a book that has a blessing attached to the reading of it. It says, Blessed is he that readeth or heareth the words contained in this prophecy. We understand the word blessed many times to mean the idea of uh, happy. Okay, the, the Beatitudes, blessed uh, are those who mourn, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed, blessed. And I, one put it this way, blessed are those who mourn means blessed are the sad or happy are the sad. They've just re, re, renegotiated the wording a little bit because there is that, that dynamic and attached to the word blessed. And we think of them as happy. The, in fact, the Greek word in the New Testament, which this is Hebrew here, but in the New Testament, the word blessed has the idea of to be congratulated because this is a person you can not only congratulate but emulate because blessed is the man who's poor in spirit means he's the guy you want to be like. You want to congratulate him. You want to emulate him because he's figured out the secret to getting to God. He's realized he's bankrupt spiritually, so poor in spirit, and he's found himself mourning over his sin, and the Bible says that he then gets comforted. Blessed are those who, who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And Jesus comes in. Blessed are thunger, hunger and thirst after rise. It's a beautiful continuum in the Beatitudes. And someone has also said about them that it's the Beatitudes, not the do attitudes. It's just this idea inside your soul that you, you realize who you are, what you are, and who God is, and what He can do for you. And that's a man to be congratulated. Now, I make much of this word here for you today because we do tend to fall into our uh, default mode. When we have a word in our mind, we think we know what it means, we kind of go there quickly. So if I were to read this, happy is the man who walketh not in the uh, counsel of the ungodly, we might be comfortable there. And it would work. It would work. This is a man who's going to be happier, if you will. He's going to be happy because he's not going to have all of the wounds that accumulate in the crew over the years. You know, if you walk in the counsel of the ungodly, you're going to do a lot of ungodly things. And as a result of that, you're going to inflict upon yourself wounds. And that is why leprosy is so much a symbol of sin because leprosy is the deadening of the, of the uh, senses. And then eventually, you know, you're hurting yourself and you're cutting your finger on a door and you don't even know it because you don't feel it. And so that's what leprosy does, and that's what sin is like. Sin is like you wound yourself, wound yourself, wound yourself, and after a while, what ends up happening is, is you don't feel any pain anymore. The Bible talks about our hearts being seared as with a hot iron if we're lost, and sometimes we are calloused, and we're, we don't even, we're not even sensitive to anything uh, bad. It's called being unscrupulous. We don't have any scruples about things. We just, you know, we lose our conscience. So when the Bible talks about blessed is the man, I want you to understand, yes, happy is the man, but this word is going to be defined a little bit further. And it means blessed is the man also. Okay? There's a difference between blessed is the man, that's somebody who we look at and you know, we can project to that this is a good guy, this guy's going to be happy. But there's another thing about the fact that you get to be blessed. If you're this guy, you're going to be blessed. In other words, God's going to answer. You walk toward him and he walks toward you. It's kind of a neat thing, okay? He gets involved and he blesses you. He upholds you by the right hand of his power. He encourages you when all else fails. He's there. He's the one who's for you. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And that's good to know. And the blessed man is the man who knows God's right there near. If you're getting down to the chilly waters of death, you're going to want to know God's there. And if you lay the foundation of a good life and a long life and a long journey in the way of righteousness, you're going to have a lot more comfort and encouragement than if you wait till the end of the road to get yourself righted with God. And certainly He can take away all the sin stains and all the wounds He can heal, but, but we still are weak in the flesh and we would quiver and we might have to, we might have to really grab hold of some promises really quick and maybe have a a little bit more support from her people by us. But if we've known him all our lives, he will make himself very, very much real to us. See, I wanted you to see the word blessed. Happy, yes, but also blessed. See it both ways. Because this is going to be defined a lot more about the, 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 the blessed way as we see the passage unfold. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. As I said, this is a journey. This is the section about the journey. You pick your counselors, don't you? Every one of us does. 
When we're young, we're placed into a family unit. If the family unit is a Christian unit, uh, and it's solid, and they're walking with God, and they're chasing the Lord, and they're loving the Lord, those kids will come up and they will catch that from us. If we at the same time go to church and we dabble in things of the Lord and we just kind of flirt with it and we put in our time, our kids get that too. And all of these are, are, are things that, that, that dictate how we will proceed in our journey. And so I suggest to you, as he says in the passage, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, I suggest to you that we all have a choice right away. If there's only two, that at least narrows it down, doesn't it? You know, people today, they think, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to try to figure out how to do, uh, do, do uh, Christianity, what that's all about. I, I believe in God. I think I believe in the Christian thing. And they'll get their uh, old yellow pages out and they'll flip open that thing. It's like five pages of small, fine print of all the churches that you can go to in America. Now, there, there are places in the world that's not like that, you know. But in America, man, we are just overwhelmed with different varieties of church. And you're going to have to choose if you have to start on your own. If nobody's given you any direction, you're going to have to choose. And when you choose, you're going to want to choose the way of righteousness. I mean, why waste your time if you're going to go to something that's compromised and not clear and not consistent? The girl I met on the plane, she says, I've been going to churches down in Tennessee. She's from uh, Memphis. Is that where Elvis is from? No. Nashville. Nashville. She's from Nashville. But he's from Memphis. See, I was thinking of Elvis. I, I don't know. I hadn't had a tune in my head. Anyway, but she was from Nashville, which was where Elvis ended up. But here's the thing. She said, I went to all these churches. She says, and she's not saved, mind you. Her mother was a Catholic who was nominal in her faith, and her dad didn't have any religion. They wanted to let their way kids figure it out. She's on her own now. And she's going to church, and she says, everywhere I go, it just seemed to be, and this is a lost person from the outside looking in, saying it, was a, it seemed like it was a lot about the show. A lot about the production, and I didn't prompt that. That was her assessment. And I thought, man, you are very astute to see that that's not what the Bible puts forth. It's about Christ. And I began to share with her on that launch pad about how Christ is the one who you want to look for. You want to make sure you pick the way that Christ is the center, and he's the end-all, be-all, of-it-all, and everything complements that. But my point is, is there's a lot of choices, aren't there? But we have to choose the right way. We have to choose. In the Old Testament, the Bible talks about kings coming into their own. When they would come into their throne, they would many times have certain people around them. And that could be good or that could be bad. Sometimes they had bad counselors, right? And many times they would surround themselves intentionally with a, a great host of false prophets. They wouldn't call them false, but prophets. And these guys would come up with all kinds of theatrics to make them think they could go win in battle because they had conjured the idea that, you know what, every time that prophet said, we're going to win, we win. And every time they said, we're going to lose, we needed to we were going to lose. And so they thought, well, we'll just get some who'll say we're going to win all the time. <laughs> and that's what happens. We choose a counselor who's going to say we're going to win all the time. I want a counselor who's going to say, I'm going to win all the time. Everything I'm doing is okay. And if you pick and choose your own counselor and you pick your way, the way, the counsel of the ungodly, you're going to begin to find yourself out in left field before you know it. You're going to say, why isn't this working for me? And as time goes on, you kind of think, well, it just doesn't work. I had my dad tell me years ago, he said, I tried that when I was a young boy, that Christian thing. He says, it just didn't work for me. And I thought, no, you just didn't get work it out because <laughs> it works. It works for everyone. You know, it will. And so it's, it's really just a, a thing that we have to choose the way in which we're going to go. And it says, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, when it says walketh not in the counsel, you have a counselor to pick. And I want to just suggest to you that Jesus Christ is wonderful counselor. That's him. It's who he is. So when people are counseling you in your life, especially about spiritual things, moral things, and right and wrong... You're going to want to make sure that, they're constantly, uh, that they constantly have their moorings in the person of Christ. Because he's the answer. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He's the wonderful counselor, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, mighty God. I'm just telling you, he's all that. I mean, he is. And if you don't know him personally, uh, you're going to try to find somebody to, to introduce you to him. And so God gives pastors and evangelists and, you know, the apostles and prophets. They're all there. But, but they're supposed to equip us. That's our, their job. My job as a pastor to equip. The Bible says that, that we would be helpers of your joy. That's all we can do. Pastors are just, we have no dominion over your faith. But we can be helpers of your joy. So when you get a pastor, you pick a pastor who's going to give you uh, Jesus. That's what you want. You want to know him. 
The Bible says He is our righteousness. And so if we want to know what the way of righteousness is, we look to Jesus. And your counselor should always be pointing you to that. And what a beautiful thing when the parents are in love with Jesus, right? I mean, think about how, how, how uh, perfect, uh, fertile that ground is, you know. And yet people could be really godly, love Jesus, and yet still the kids can go left and right because they have to choose too. But if you love on Jesus and you keep loving on them, you have a good hope that they might even come back around, you know. When I was a little boy, I didn't have a church home or a home rooted in church in Christ. And, but I came across some booklets. I read them and I embraced the, the truth because my heart was tender and I prayed every time. I read those little tracks and I'm like, man, this is so good. Dear God, I want to be saved. I believe with you all my heart. Jesus died for me. I believe it. Please save me. And you know what? <laughs> he did. <laughs> I'm so glad to tell you. And not only did he save me, but he kept me. The Bible says, He that is born of God does not continue in sin, for his seed remains in him. That's 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. I found that verse after I got saved, and I said, there it is. Man, I didn't know why I couldn't get away with sin, and I'd sinned for a few years, and I just felt miserable, and got more miserable, and it got drier and drier, but I didn't know. I didn't have chapters and verses telling me, you know, you need to turn around this. I just knew I was doing wrong, but it, I could never kill that knowledge. I could never squelch it. I could never turn it down. There would be seasons I'd go for a little bit, but it always would come back up. Somebody would always asked me a question about God, and I couldn't just deny him because I knew him. Oh, I knew him. And bless him, he knew me. He knew me. And he kept coming after me. And if you're his child, he'll keep coming after you. But see, that's because I picked the right counsel. I found the gospel. When I found it, I accepted it. And then he took up residence in me. That's important. Because the Bible says, He that comes to me, I will in no way cast out. That means no way. It didn't say in no way, in no way except when you decide you're going to be bad. <laughs> I want to just tell you a little secret. Sometimes you're going to decide to be bad. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of like, I don't know how many of you have ever been shocked by an outlet. You know, maybe you worked on it without turning the light switch off or the power breaker off, you know. That is one weird feeling right there. There's no other feeling like that. How many of you saw the YouTube video, perhaps, of the guys who locked themselves up in a little contraption to make them feel like what it would be like to have a baby? Did you all see? How many saw that? Anybody? Yeah, the people who were bitter. You were the bitter one. You're like, oh, he needs to know what to know. I'm just kidding. Yeah, she just had a couple babies, so she thought that's pretty interesting. But they put them on Facebook, and you think, man, they've got these men, and they're just crying. they got tears, and the girls are like... <laughs> And the guys are, ah, it was terrible to watch. Why would you do that? I mean, even the ladies would say, why did I do that? Then they put a baby in their arms and they say, I know why I did it. Here's my point. Sometimes when you do things on purpose, bad, God doesn't give up on you. But he'll let you get shocked. He might let you get shocked. He might let you feel that buzz that comes from getting your fingers on the, on the open outlet. Or he might make you to get a little burn on your hand from touching something you ought not. He might make you dry up. David said it this way, when I kept silent, you know, toward God, my vitality dried up. I went about all the day in groaning or roarings. He said, ah, oh, it just was miserable. <coughs> blessed, oh, happy. Oh, blessed and happy is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And the ungodly have a whole lot to say, don't they? Find yourself a counselor that is a lost man who has no moorings in Christ, and he calls himself a psychologist. Let me give you a little heads up on the word psychology. The word psychology is from a compound Greek word. Logos is the ology part. Logos is the word. And then suke is the word psychology. Psych and suke. Psych and suke. Su suke is the Greek word for soul. So what you're doing is you're going perhaps to a person who's a counselor, calls himself a psychologist who's lost. He's going to be a psychologist. He's going to be a soulologist and he doesn't even know anything about the soul. Uh, Christ is the one who knows the soul. He knows the soul. The Bible says, What shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? What will it profit a man who gains the whole world and loses his own soul? So you want to know somebody who's got something to say about the soul that has a little bit of teeth to it, some truth behind it. And so I suggest to you, as he says, you have to choose your counselors. That's true sometimes in your day-to-day -day with, with personal problems, but certainly about your spiritual uh, journey. 
It says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. We're going to get back to that word ungodly. He comes up again and again. The Bible says the ungodly shall not stand, verse 5, in judgment. The Bible says at the end of verse 6, the ungodly, the way of the ungodly shall perish. So the ungodly, these are, these are people who are out there. They're, 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 there's a whole bunch of them. In fact, the, the Bible mentions many times a remnant uh, when it refers to the Christians. You know, the remnant usually. It's a very small group oftentimes because the world is hostile to the things of grace. But the ungodly... There are different people. We're going to look at them a little closer in a minute, so we'll pass by that. But if the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. That counsel can be to do headlong evil, or that can be counsel to just be uh, moral. It might be a person who counsels you to be ethical and nice and kind and gracious and, and polite, but not anything about God. It's the ungodly. And the Bible says, You don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, you'll be blessed. It says, Nor stand in the way of sinners. Because it's a journey, you walk, meaning you go on forward. It's making progress. But then there's this standing. Now, in years past, men used to stand when a lady walked into the room. Remember that? <laughs> now it's like a competition, you know, uh, who can be meaner and who can be tougher and who can be stronger. No, we need to remember our moorings. The Bible says, stand in the presence of an older man. Stand in the presence of an older man. Uh, we got uh, Wayne sometimes. You know, I'll come over to shake his hand. Wayne will stand up. I said, man, you don't stand up for me. And he said, no, sir, I'm standing up for the minister. So bless your heart. But I would stand for him. He's older than me. And I would want to do that. And I try to remember my, my moorings and my, my, my mindset in Christ. You know, the Bible says standing has the idea, therefore, of respect. Standing in respect, if you will, of the way of sinners. If you were to go through there, you'd see this word standing has to, be, has to do with the idea of abiding, to stand in the way of sinners. Have you ever been somewhere where you thought, I shouldn't be here? <laughs> when I got to my graduation, I had been right with the Lord for about, a, oh, about eight, nine months. I thought I could sneak into one of the parties that they had. You know, one of the people, one of the girls that I had in a class, she said, come to my party. And I thought, I could sneak in there. By the time I was in there about an hour or two, man, I had done three or four things wrong and bad and I shouldn't have done. And eventually I just knew I shouldn't be here. But I stood there for at least the three, three infractions, okay? And I, I felt bad, especially when it was an off group that no, nobody knew me. And then one girl walked, hey, glad to have you back. Because I'd walked away and walking with the Lord. And there, oh, glad to have you back. And so I just knew I shouldn't be here. You ever stand in the way of sinners? You're in there? You shouldn't have been in there? You were doing that? You shouldn't have been doing that? You're just standing. And it's standing in respect to. It's abiding, if you will, in the way of sinners. The sinners have a broad way. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there be that find it. So you got that broad way. The sinners have a broad way. There's a whole lot of room for you. You know, and they'll accept you. No matter what you're like, they'll accept you. The Bible says the, you don't want to be the person who stands in the way of sinners. You don't want to stand in respect to it. And you don't want to be the person who abides in that room. And it says, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And this word for sit, uh, sitting has the idea of actually marrying it. It has the idea of to dwell there, to sit down there, to remain there. And it's actually a word that's used for being married to it. Can you see that? Sitting in the seat of the scornful. And also the idea of the seat, seat there has the idea of judgment, a place of judgment. You know, when they would have a, a, a occasion to have some people make a judgment because nobody can, can come up with the right answer for something, they'd go to the, seat, uh, the city gates where the, the elders would sit. It was a place of judgment. Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Uh, Sodom. And they said, who made him, when they got all indignant toward him through that bad night when they, they were destroyed, uh, they said, who made him a judge and a ruler over us? Because he sat in the seat of, uh, of judgment. Now, what happens is, is this is a continuum. You walk, you stand, and then you sit. Okay, this is the journey. And you're walking or maybe you're right now, you've already made some choices of your counselors. This is where you're going to be. And now you're standing in respect to that thing. And ultimately, you will be the one sitting in the seat. About 40, 50 years ago, I was sitting where you are with my pastor saying some things. My pastor is gone now. And now here I am sitting or standing or taking his, what I would say, seat. 
Okay? Here I am now positioned where he was. Why? Because he moved on and now it's my turn. As you get to the end of your day, uh, uh, your journey, you're going to want to sit a little bit more. <laughs> you ever find that to be true? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, we're talking. I think I'll just sit down and listen and talk. Will you go, go talk. Go t- I'm just, no, I'm just sitting down. Why? Because I'm tired. I don't want to stand anymore. Well, that's the way of it. Life gets like that. You walk, you stand, and you applaud the things around you. You appreciate them. You show your approval. And eventually, you're the person who now, you're the person who now is influential in making judgments for other people because they're looking for counsel for you, from you. That's what happens. And interestingly, if you are in the continuum of the ungodly, it's going to be a seat of scorn. A seat of scorn. The word scornful has the idea of, uh, of making faces. I remember the song in Pink Floyd Animals album. They said, you know, uh, the, the song called Dogs. And it was about the lost man. And it said, after a while, you can work on points for style. Like a sudden look in the eye and an easy smile. And what he's saying in this passage is a lot like that. If you make faces or roll your eyes, oh, there's a Christian. You know, people do that. Oh, it's a Christian, uh, they, 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 they might sigh. It's a contortion of the face or it's a rolling of the eyes. Scorning has the idea of pursing the lips and hating on somebody else. We, as believers, have to be careful to control that in ourselves. We don't want to look down on the world in an indignant fashion. We need to look at them with pity. And so we have to be careful. But, but, but the lost man, he just gets harder and harder and harder. And anything that, that bumps his uh, paradigm... He begins to become a little bit more antagonistic toward. You know, you walk, you gave your whole life to this thing. And now you're sitting in your twilight years and people are asking your opinion. And your opinion becomes one of scorn, you know. Don't do that. Go this way. Pilgrim's Progress used the worldly wise man as the guy who would be good to plug in here. He would tell you, seek morality and seek civility. You don't need Christianity. But all those things are works and they fall short. The Bible says you have a journey. The journey is you're going to be blessed if you don't do this. Don't go that way. Don't go walking in the counsel of the ungodly. The ungodly will tell you through movies, through through books. uh, The ungodly will tell you through peer pressure. It will tell you through TV programs. It will tell you through all of the things that it has. It will tell you everything you you need to, to, to do in order to do life right. You know, you want to get rich. You want to have, you know, a token wife. You want to have the car. You want to have... And this is... Those are all good things to have wives and houses and, and funds in the mind. The Bible talks about God prospers, so we're going to talk about that. But I'm saying, they say, go for that. Forget the, forget the, 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 the thing about Jesus. Man, that's, that's not something. That's not something you want. So you see, he says, don't do that. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We're going to talk about that ungodly because he's, he's got something more to tell us about him. And, and we're going to drill into that in a minute. But verse 2 says, but his delight. Okay? This is the man who's blessed. Who's the man who's blessed? It's the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, for most of us, uh, in our journeys with the Lord, when we first get saved, we don't know very much about God. We just get saved. And we're very fastidious. So we hear the words, law of the Lord, and what we hear is the law. Okay? That God's law. Oh, what law? No. You see, law in this context doesn't mean all about the Old Testament law, the Pentateuch, you know, the law of Moses. It's talking about the whole ball of wax. God put a lot of laws in the world. And he told us about them. Uh, It's sort of like the whole idea of, of, of the laws of gravity, you know. Every time a scientist does things in the, in the laboratory, they depend upon laws that God has put into play, right? If they're going to separate the white blood cells from the red blood cells and they use centrifugal force, that's a law that they're counting on. This is They're counting on something happening that is established. And the law of the Lord is an established truth. It first of all happens in nature, and then we begin to backtrack it, and we realize it's not just in nature, it's also in the Scripture. (laughs) I love that, because I've got a word. I know what the soul is. It's eternal. I know that it's going to have a judgment. There's a journey and there's a judgment. He's told me that. He's He's not sneaking up on me. He's not trying to trick me. He's told me what's going to happen. And the Bible says he's the person who's not walking in the counsel of the ungodly, he has his delight in the law of the Lord. Why? Because that's where the counsel you really need is going to come from. 
It's not only going to be counsel that comes in the way of principles that are established, but also in its particulars. There are a lot of scientific things in the Bible that people have drawn down on and thus begun to realize God knows what's up. (laughs) Okay? Do you know those uh, trade routes that they use all the time? Those were in the Bible. The Bible says he put the rivers in the seas. And some guy said, I'm going to sit down and figure out where those rivers are. Where are those rivers in the oceans? And they found them. There's actually trade routes. It makes things go quicker and smoother. They don't have to go straight across and go through all the terrors that you hear about in the sea. They get on the trade routes. The man has a statue. I think it's in, the, in Washington, D.C. And he's got, he's got a statue. His Bible's right beside his, his chair where he's sitting. We also have these, uh, the, the life of the flesh is in the blood. They, they do all this blood work to find out what's wrong with you. It's all the, the whole thing is right there. Your whole, your whole record's right in your blood. The Bible says God sits upon the circle of the earth. He told us it was a circle of the earth. The Bible tells us, tells us, tells us. In particular, David was run out of town and he writes a psalm while, Saul, while Absalom is trying to take his throne from him. He writes a psalm. He says, man, I just want to get back to, I just want to get back to Jerusalem and I want to just to behold I just want to behold the, the tabernacle of God. Because he wasn't able to build the temple. He had a tabernacle. He says, I want to just even see the, uh, the little sparrows making its nest up in the tent. I want to see that because that's meaningful. Everything about this. People would go in sad. They'd come out happy because they got, well, they got their sins expiated. They got some propitiation through the blood. And he would look at those things. And every particular of every sacrifice was something died so you could live. Something died so you could live. Well, that can't be. That's not equal. Those are just animals. And he says, you get in there. Keep going. Keep going. Yes, the Messiah would come. He would be wounded for my transgressions. He would be crushed for my iniquities. The chastisement for my peace was upon him. With his stripes, I'm going to be healed. I'm now looking. Abraham saw Jesus' day, and he rejoiced to see it. You see, he got particulars in things. And he says, you know, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And the word, he says, he says he not only has a delight in it, but it says in his law he does meditate day and night. If you underline that word meditate, it's an interesting word. In our day, we're told to meditate in, in the, in the, in the uh, counsel of the ungodly. They say meditation is really good. They say women do better with meditation than men. I just read an article on that the other day. I'm not going to go anywhere with it, but it's just it's interesting, this whole idea. But what they usually mean when they talk about meditation is emptying your mind. Emptying your mind. Just empty your mind and just put yourself in a place. And they even have things called mantras. They like you to say some meaningless word over and over again so you can just crush out everything so you're not, you're not inundated with all of the thoughts that, that, that cumber you in day to day. And they say, you know, you need to do that. That's not what meditation is. Meditation. Scriptural meditation is not emptying your mind, it's filling your mind. Meditation means to go over and over again in your mind on God, God to go over and over God's Word in your mind again and again. Just keep going over it, like memorizing. You will find you do memorize if you're doing this. But the Bible says that in His law, He does meditate day and night. The word literally means He murmurs. He murmurs literally with pleasure. <laughs> That's what meditation... Have you ever done that? I know some of y'all are talking to yourself all the time. You need to be careful about that. Somebody's going to get you. You know what's cool? We got these cell phones. Now, you put this little thing in your ear, they'll think you're just talking to somebody. You can just do whatever. You can walk through the, hey, you know, I mean, I'm, yeah, the Bible says, blessed is a man. Walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Stands in the way of sinners. And they're just thinking you're telling somebody on the phone. You can fake them out. And you can get away with talking out loud. You can murmur in a good way. You're murmuring to yourself. You're muttering back and forth to yourself the words of God. Do you do that? Listen, this is the right way. This is not a uh, idea, a good idea. This is what he says. He says, you're not walking in that council. What you're doing is you're murmuring or ruminating over God's word day and night. That's, that's where you live. You know, you do something you feel bad about. You go back and you say, man, I feel bad about that. And you go back and revisit it and fix it. You get, to get it under the blood. You're a person who has every right to go back to the throne, no matter what you've done. The Bible says if we, who are His children, confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, faithful to do it, and just to do it. I love that. He's got a reason, and He will do it, and He can do it, and He wants to do it. Only thing is stopping Him from cleansing our sins sometimes is that we don't confess them. And confessing simply means to tell on ourselves to God, God, I did that. You know, I'm sorry. And he says, okay, come on over here, give me a hug, let's go on. 
We're back in fellowship that quick. How cool is that? When I was 17 years old or 16, gave my heart back to Christ where I'd gotten away. And, in the, in, uh, you know, I was, he, knew, he knew my circumstances like he knows yours. I didn't have anybody taking me to church. I was 12 to 16 out in the field playing around chasing butterflies. But here he brought me back. The moment I confessed, he took me home. And he confirmed it to my soul to the point where I could go to school the next day and say, I, I, you know, the guys are trying to get me to go do the old things and walk in the old ways. I said, no, I, got, I finally just told him I got saved. Well, I didn't know that I had been saved before, but that was my vernacular at the time. And they said, oh, oh, okay. And they started, oh, oh, oh sort of like, oh, I don't want to touch him. He's got something on him. <laughs> you know, no, got something in him. <laughs> I got Jesus, man. He's good, too. And it was hard at first. But he says his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he does meditate day and night. That's the other guy. So now, now we're really drawing a clear distinction about the way. Okay, counsel of the ungodly. Notice where that's at. That's out there. That's other people imposing upon you how it looks. Right? That's external. But what's this internal thing? I'm taking the word of God and I'm meditating on it because God's the only one who's got the right answers. God's the one who will give you an answer. Now, if you don't know the answer, find the answer. You can ask somebody the answer. But be careful who you ask. Make sure you ask people who are going to be more about Jesus. The Bible says his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he doth meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You see that word planted? That's passive. He's planted. He didn't plant himself. He's planted. He begins to meditate on God's word. Next thing, he's going along the way just saying, muttering to himself the things of God. He finds himself in a very lush oasis kind of place. This is good, 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 good ground. Uh, says he'll be planted by the rivers of water. So he's getting refreshment. He's going to be the guy who's going to find, oh, yeah, there's going to be seasons of drought, but it's going to quickly be lush and good again. He's going to fix that. You know, all, uh, old uh, Japanese, I think it was, proverb says, all sunshine makes desert. You can't have all sunshine. You're going to have to have some, you have to have some desert, a uh, little bit of desert spots. But you're going to always be planted by the rivers of water if you're meditating on his word because he'll give you what you need right when you need it. That's what he does. Because why? Because he's a good shepherd. Think about that. What's a shepherd do? He leads the forest. Uh, he leads to the to the to the to the waters, and he leads to the to the high grass. The Bible says he makes me lie down in green pastures. That's what he does. Still waters and green pastures. He says he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And look at this. That bringeth forth his fruit in his season. You underline those words. His fruit in his seasons. That means you've got fruit. And you've got seasons, I've got my fruit, and I've got my seasons. God has a plan for me, and He's got a plan for you. Your fruit is going to be the fruit God expects to get out of you, you know? If I'm going to plant a, an apple seed, I'm going to expect to get apples. If I'm going to plant a, a nut tree, uh, I'm going to expect to get whatever you get. <laughs> Skip. <laughs> Just kidding. I had to find somebody. But you should sit down here in harm's way. Yeah. The nut tree. Well, you're going to get the nut tree. I'm going to get whatever he gets. Uh, so we got that going on. See, you're going to, some of you are going to be apples. Some of you are going to be pears. Some of you are going to be, you know, just all these different kinds of things. Because God loves variety. And your measure is not my measure. My measure is not your measure. I'm just going to be in my season because God's got his eye on me. You are a plant in his garden and you've got seed. You've got fruit to bear in your season. And it may be a long time before you bear that fruit. But when you bear it, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be exactly what God had in mind for you. Now, we understand that we can walk a little bit in both councils. But the guy who's got this thing clear, he's going to try to stay to the straight path. When Pilgrim on Pilgrim's Progress, Christian in Pilgrim's Progress got off because he says it's a little smoother to walk over there. He started walking over there pretty soon. He ended up in Giant Despair's Castle. Man, he was saying, I don't even know what's going on. Because he went on the other side, but he could never get away from the fact, I got a key in my pocket. It's called Promise. It'll open every door in Doubting Castle. And he understood the word because he ruminated. After he got a hold of it, he got loose again. He got what? Water. He got refreshment. He'll be like a... He'll be like a tree planted in, by the rivers of water, and he'll bring forth his fruit in his season. You see, this is all personal. You see that? It's not talking about a collective. It's talking about you. It's talking about me. It's talking about the man, the individual. And we all have fruit to bear. And we just need to be walking, ruminating, and taking God's word and making it our delight. In our, our delight. Years ago, I heard a guy say it this way. He says, the guy who loves God, the person who's in the way of righteousness, has no greater joy than in a nook with the book. <laughs> okay, that's where it's at right there. That's good stuff. 
We want that. Because this is the haven. This is the oasis. Now, the problem is we hold our breath for so long, and then we get back to it. We say, man, what have I... Man, oh, it's so good. God, you're so good. You're just talking to me. And he does that. Now, at first, we don't know where to look, but you just keep reading. It'll get something will come along, because God will see to it. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He leads us into truth. The Bible says, the ungodly are not so. It says, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And I told you I was going to get back to this guy, because this guy... He can be deceptive. He's not just bad. He's, he's deceptive. Because chaff, chaff, it looks just like wheat. It looks just like it. The difference is it only has the externals, right? You got the kernel of the wheat, and then you got the chaff. It's sort of like that, you know, those peanuts you eat with the, 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 the hole on them, is it called? A hole or something? And, and it got that brown. That thing, is fa- it's just the right shape to go over that peanut because it grew with it. This is what chaff is. It's that outer, uh, you know, superfluous stuff. So what they would do is they would take the wheat, and they'd go to a winnowing trough, and they'd throw it up, usually on a little rise in the air, so the air could get that wheat, blow away the chaff. Okay, this is... This is what chaff is. Chaff in its own, be hard to separate little by little. So you throw it up, let the wind blow away the light stuff. Why I'm saying this? Because it says, he walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. The ungodly sometimes are, are people who think they're Christians. Sometimes they are not living as if they're God. The, the, the difference is a godly person and an ungodly person. ungodly person just lives every day as if there is no God. I mean, you can go to church and do all the ABCs of the Christian life and not be... A Christian, the Bible talks about it on several fronts, right? You got the wheat and the chaff. You got the the wheat and the tares. They both look a lot alike. You can't rip one up without ripping the other one up. And you've got the goats and the sheep. They both sound alike, right? They bad. Their little sounds are almost coming. Sound alike. And and you you, just, you have all this different stuff that, that they they're, they're different, but they look alike. So the ungodly, the ungodly. Their ungodly counsel could be, I'm in church, but I don't get Jesus. The ungodly counsel would be, I go to church and I get prosperity. I get, I get bad theology. I get, I get Jesus is a good guy. I get Jesus is a good teacher. I get, well, Israel has been replaced by the church. I get, you know, Jesus already is here and the, there is no second coming. There is no rapture. There is no judgment. There is no hell. There is no, but you're in church. And so, Let me assure you, with all of my doctorate degrees, that I know, and you need to listen to me, you don't have anything to worry about, just be a nice person. Well, boy, that just took everything out of the equation. You don't have anything to worry about. But you were in church when it said. Now, this is what can happen, and because we're 2,000 years down the road, 2,000 years down the road, we have a whole whirlwind, a firestorm, if you will, of stuff that is confusing. And that's why I say, this didn't say... He walks in the counsel of the godly. He walks in the counsel of the Bible. In his law, God says, the man who is righteous walks in the law of the Lord, meditates in the law of the Lord day and night. He not say, go look for a person. But if you read the Word of God, he'll say, there are people you can look to. But you don't look to those people first. You look to the Word of God first. You want the real thing. I'll tell you something. You and I have been been given a whole lot of fake stuff in this world, haven't we? We're, we're comfortable with fake stuff. You ever get that perfume for your wife? You're going for Christmas, it's Christmas or her birthday, you're going to get that perfume. And you think, this is great, I got my idea. I'm going to get my perfume. You go in here, you look at that bottle, and that thing is $110. You're like, what? The thing's about that big. Then they got this little thing over here on the side. Can I get a witness? I said, huh? Yeah, amen. I got that little thing over here. Ten bucks, man. And you get a coupon for another one when you're done with that one. You're good, right? She's going to be so happy with me. I got her some perfume that she loves. You pull that baby out all proud of yourself. She's, what's this? She knows. She's been in that store. And you got her the $10 bottle. That was not walking in the counsel of the Word of God, okay? That was, that was going for the fake stuff. That was the counsel of the ungodly you were going with there. You understand, we get a lot of fake stuff. We like the quick, easy, schmeasy stuff. Do you know this journey is not for the faint of heart? You're not going to get the shortcuts to spiritual Christian 
growth. You've got to invest yourself in the Word of God. He says the ungodly is somebody who's like around the rim, around the edges. He's going to look perhaps pretty good on the outside, so he will be believable. You know, the devil doesn't bring you a, the, the dragon look when he comes to get you to go do something wrong. The Bible says Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He's going to look really good. And even, therefore, his ministers will be transformed into an angel of light. When he comes in the book of Revelation in chapter uh, 6, the Bible says he comes on a white horse. His Antichrist comes on a white horse. He doesn't come on a black horse with a black hat with a patch on his eye and a scar on his face and say, yeah, get in line. He says, I've got your answers. Uh, he's not stupid. He's been studying us for a long time. He knows what you want to hear, what you want to see, what you want to do. But you need to not go for what you want to. That's the, that's the chaff. The chaff is all about the external. No, you've got to get down to the meat bee, and you've and you got to want what's real. And the Bible says the wind drives it away. I remember a, a, a song that you all probably will remember this line from the song, Stairway to Heaven. It says, your stairway lies on the whispering wind. You remember that? Every time you were listening to those songs, they were programming you. You know, carry on, my wayward son. Kansas had that album, right? Carry on. You're good. There'll be peace when you're done. They're just telling you what you want to hear. And you're like, yeah, this is great. I love that song. Man, that beat's great. But they're lying to you. And they're seducing you into the evil. And now it's in every movie, every TV show. I mean, it used to be Ozzy and Harriet. Now it's Bob and Joe. I don't know. It's weird. It's out of control. We don't even know what's up anymore. All I'm saying for you and for me is, is to realize that the world in which we live is full of ungodliness. And now we have people who say they're Christian and they're doing things that are obviously, what I just said, a Bob and Joe scenario. They're, they're sanctioning it. They're marrying that. They're putting them in your, pat, in your pulpits. It's, it's church. That's all you needed to know. That's chaff. Okay, Chaff is, if you think the externals, you just need a church with some pews and a sign out front, that makes it a church. It's not. Because, in fact, we all know, don't we? The church is not the building anyway. It's the people. <laughs> We're the ones who are called out. But, see, we, we like that chaff level. And so what I suggest to you is that, that this is something to keep a mind on. When he contrasts the, the counsel of the ungodly, he count, contrasts it with the, with the meditation on the Word of God, the law of God. The ungodly are not like that. They are the people who go after all the externals. He says they're like chaff, and the wind drives them away. That means when preaching comes down that's real, the chaff will bristle, and they won't endure it. This is what we have in for, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, where the Bible says, In the last days men will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, not willing, to endure sound doctrine. The chaff will be driven away by the preaching of the word. And it's like the chaff is driven by the wind. Uh, the whispering winds is what they like, so they'll go after whispering wind, winds rather than the, than the word of God being declared clearly. Now, this is where we turn the corner, and as I say, the ungodly was important to know. They're mentioned all the way through here. The ungodly are like chaff. They look like you. They smell like you. They act like you. They do the things you do, and they, they seem okay, but there's something very shallow. There's no substance there. They don't love the Word of God, and frankly, the only thing he puts in there is they delight in the Word of God, and they meditate on the Word of God, and if you only have one thing you can get out of that, take it, because that's worth taking. Okay, I'm not going to tell you to give. I'm not going to tell you to go to church. I'm not going to tell you to pray. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you this. Meditate on the Word of God. All that other stuff will take care of itself. Amen? That's right. It's the way it is. And the Bible says in this passage, as it turns from the there is a journey to there is, uh, that there is a judgment, he says the ungodly is not so. It says, uh, it says, therefore the ungodly, because they're like the chaff that the wind drives away, verse 5, it says, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Now, when I hear that, I'm, I, I'm uh, well enough aware of what the Bible teaches about God's presence uh, to know that it's a pretty powerful picture to think of standing in the presence of God, okay, in the presence of judgment. Uh, we know that John, the apostle who wrote the book of Revelation, the book of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he's, he's the beloved disciple. He was great. But when he saw Jesus in Revelation 1, he fell on his face as one dead. That's what happened. He fell, okay? But what happened? Jesus lifted him up and stood him on his feet. Do you know what? The believer who's in the way of righteousness may faint away like Isaiah. Oh, I'm undone. I've seen the Lord. I'm undone. I'm ruined. That's what you're going to feel like. But you will not just stand if you're his child. You will be made to stand. <laughs> and it's not just in respect to him, but in honor to be received because you chose the right way, the way of 
righteousness. We talked about those beatitudes a moment ago, and those beatitudes tell us, Blessed is the man who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for he shall be filled. Christ is our righteousness. When you're hungering after somehow getting this thing right, you'll find Jesus is the way to get this thing right. He is the end-all, be-all of it all. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the hero. Meditate on Him, and it will relieve a whole lot of the stressors you live with in the day-to-day. Your failures. He will not only have you standing, He will cause you to stand. He will uphold you, the Bible says, by the right hand of His power. Jesus is the right hand of God. So the judgment's coming. He says, but the ungodly are not going to stand. They're going to uh, come unglued. When Isaiah said, I am, uh, I am undone, woe unto me, I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. Did you hear that? He was so uh, overwhelmed by what he saw, the first thing he thought of was, man, I've said some things I shouldn't say. Or I've used some language I shouldn't use. Or I've made jokes I shouldn't have made. Bam! Whoa! Yeah! yeah that's all. That's all he saw was himself and his wickedness in that area. What would you see? (laughs) What would I see in that moment? But aren't you glad that that story didn't end there? I'm ruined, I'm undone. The Bible says the the Father sent, uh, God sent an angel to take some coals from an altar standing by, and he took those altars and he touched his mouth, and he says, I've therefore purged your sin. And he says, now... Now, who will go for us? Whom shall we send? And now he could say what he always wanted to say. Here am I. Send me. You see, guys, if you're meditating on the Word of God, you're going to know there's some coals of fire coming. If you're meditating on the Word of God, you're going to know Jesus is your righteousness. You're going to know that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And He is the way of righteousness. And if you follow Him, you'll be fishers of men. But you don't go there. You don't go there out of the gate. You don't take a toddler and say, now take out the trash. (laughs) You're picking up after them all the time for a while. And then after a while, they begin to get to the age where they can take out the trash, mow the lawn, do your nails, bring you your paper, uh, get your slippers. It's good. It's good. You just keep that going on, you know. After a while, those kids begin to engage, right? And that's what God wants for us. We need to be people who understand the way of righteousness. The Bible says they will not stand in the judgment. They're going to be decimated. They're going to become unglued. They think, oh, but the Bible says every knee is going to be made to bow, right? They're going to be bowing, but they're going to have to even be propped up to do that (laughs) because they're going to be a mess. Every sin flooding in their soul, everyone, everyone, no expiation, No propitiation, no cleansing, no forgiveness. All in one flood rush of everything. Everything said, well, I'll tell them about my good... You need to think about your good things. The only thing that will come to the wicked man's mind is every wicked thing he ever did. Every time he dismissed a Christian or made fun of a Christian or mocked God or took God's name in vain. How many oh my gods are you going to have on your conscience when the time comes? How many Jesus Christs in vain are you going to have on your conscience? Those are big. The Bible says, my enemies take my name in vain. My enemies take my name in vain. You and I live in a day where we're just so loose and fast and and it, it gets on us sometimes. And so we have to keep ourselves in check. But the Bible says the ungodly will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Now, I want you to see the, the bright spot here. There's a congregation over here. Okay? you got judgment. you got the Bema seat, which is the where you get rewards. And then you got the great white throne. But I'm so glad there's a congregation. You know, I'm going from this congregation. I'm going to go to another one. <laughs> when I get out of here, I'm going to a city whose builder and maker is God. I'm going to Mount Zion. I'm going to go to the place where the spirit of just men made perfect live. I'm going to be one of the saints of God. I'm going to be the bride of Christ. And there is the honor. We're going to be able to stand, but not just stand, but stand in honor. Is it not cool to go to a wedding and you see that everything's all seated? The guy's down here looking as best he can with what he's got to work with. He's up here. He's looking. He's a mess. He's scared to death. His face is white. He's thinking, am I going to run? Am I going to make it? Am I going to faint? And all of a sudden, everything stops. The doors open and that bride, I'm talking the bride now because the groom is Jesus in this picture of marriage, but the bride walks in and what happens? Everybody stands for her. They're going to stand for you. 
You're not only going to be made to stand, you're going to be stood for. You're going to be honored. And you're going to go into a congregation. He says they're not going to stand in the congregation. This is the ungodly. Not going to, but we're going to be in that one because we've chosen the right way. He says they're not going to stand in the... Uh, sinners are not going to stand in the congregation of the righteous. But we will. And why is this? It says because in verse 6, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now, an interesting thing about these ungodly is this, this shell kind of thing I brought out a minute ago. And what I want to suggest to you is that the, the way to perceive this is that the one has depth, right? We mentioned that. And the other is shallow. I want you to understand something. We could kind of put it in this way to put it down to it because he used the word meditate. People who meditate are internal. They're deep. They're thinking about God's word. Now, this is good exercise in your family sometimes. Let's go back and forth. Maybe as a couple, if you don't have the kids anymore, you can say, well, I'll say a verse, you say a verse, I'll say a verse, you say It's a good little kind of thing. How many verses can you come up with? And then determine to get to know more. Because this is, this is what we do. We traffic in the truth. The Bible says you're going to speak about the Lord when you go out. You're going to speak about Him when you come in, when you lie down, when you get up. You're going to just, He's going to be part of your core. That's deep. So you can either be a person who is wheat or you can be chaff. Now, the chaff is not the guy who meditates. He's the guy who mitigates. He's saying, well, I can do this and I'm thinking of that and I've got this. And, and that's a person who's got that shallow thing going on. And that's chaff because that's what chaff is. It looks like the wheat, but it's not the wheat. The depth is what we're looking for. Now, when I got to ready to tell you that story about that frog a little bit, a bit ago, I told you about this frog, and he, he calls the psychic hotline, and he calls in there, and he says, listen, I'm, I'm lonely. He says, can you tell me what's going on in my future? And the psychic said, yeah, you're going to have a girl, and she's going to be a beautiful young girl, and she's going to love hearing all, or learning all about you. Am I going to get her at a party? Uh, no, a biology class. I mean, it's great, right? Do <laughs> you know God knows the way of the ungodly? He knows how we are. And He knows the way, it says in verse 6, of the righteous. Do you know that there's a way here? The only thing He said was the Word of God. Let God be God. Let God be God. Do you know what the difference between a Bible study and church services are? Many times in Bible studies, it becomes everybody saying what they think the Bible means. But when you go to a church service or a church-run Bible study, is literally doing it the right way, is it becomes the Word of God tells us what it says about us and about God. We're not about, we don't judge God and tell, put Him in the box we want Him in. We let God judge us through His Word, and then we adjust. The Bible says the man who goes, uh, that people who are hearers and not doers are people who are like a man who looks in the mirror and sees himself and straight away goes away forgetting what manner man he is. We, we adjust because we're meditating. Oh, he said that. Now, I've got to tell you, this is not for the weak of heart. Do you remember uh, Kermit the Frog? He used to have a saying, it ain't easy being green. Now, I'm not going to go out there on a limb and call you all frogs, but I'm just... Want you to know we're all green. We're all sinners. And we need help. We needed to be saved. And Jesus saves. He is our righteousness. And when we trust Him as our Savior, He does what He says. He saves us. And the more you nail that down in your Bibles and in your minds from passage to passage to passage, the more you're not going to be uh, all the time sitting at the door of the, of the banqueting hall. You're going to know you have every right to walk in, pull out a chair, and sit down. Because this is the house of God. And I am going to abide in the house of God forever. Because He promised me I would. You and I live in a, in a great place down here, but it's not for the weak of heart because you are being battered by the counsel of the ungodly every day. You have to choose to meditate on God's Word. You have to get it down in your core because that's your sword. When you're fighting the devil and when you're fighting the flesh and when you're fighting the world, you need to know the Word of God. The Bible says you have to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's your only offensive weapon. You got shields, you got helmets, you got breastplates, but down to it, you got to have that book. And I'll tell you, man, when you, when you meditate on the Word of God, even if you get yourself off sometimes, which you will, you're going to be in Giant Despair's Castle, you're going to be in the castle of uh, Doubting Castle and Giant Despair's Castle down there in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this dungeon. You're going to be miserable. You're going to despair of life. 
But then one of the moments you're going to just wake up and God's going to put you back on those on that rivers of water. He's going to refresh you. He's going to feed you. He's going to stand you back up because you're going to be like a tree planted by a river of water. That word's in there. Beloved, I don't know about you, but I think this is a cool song. I think it's awesome. I think it's got everything you need for life and godliness. And if you'll just take this psalm and you'll put it in your heart and you'll recognize there are two ways, only two ways. Jesus said the broad way and the narrow way. He says the way of righteousness and the way of the ungodly. We need to make sure we're on the way of righteousness. Would you bow with me for a moment?